Hello, I'm Dr. Loren M. Hill with The Acclivity. I am your academic career coach. And today I'm here with Dr. Linda Liang. And Dr. Liang uh, is a colleague of mine. She's so accomplished in the area of executive leadership coaching. She has over uh, 3,000 hours of coaching in the, and she has a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology. She's also an ICFACC certified coach, and her credentials go on and on and on. But rather than spending a lot of time talking about that, because I want to make sure that we dedicate the time to getting all of her expertise for today, um, I just want to say welcome, Dr. Liang, and thank you for joining us today on our podcast with the Academic Career Coach. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. I'm delighted to be here. And so today our topic is the secret of success, power and executive presence for people of color and women. So Dr. Liang, you are uh, very accomplished in this area. You've authored articles and you've done a number of studies. Um, can you tell us about power um, and particularly power with women and people of color? What, what have you found? Well, that's a great question, Dr. Hill. I found that power gets mixed up with a lot of other things and it gets a bad connotation, especially on TV. So I like to define power as being able to fully utilize your capabilities to give your gifts to the world to reach success and also to be able to empower others to reach their highest levels of success as opposed to control, which means to curb, restrain, or hold back. So if we're talking about power versus control, control is power over others, and control would be power with others. Uh, control would be telling others what to do, whereas power would be helping others to accomplish their goals. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much for explaining that. I remember some years ago when I was studying for my licensure for the board, we had to um, learn about leaderships and types of power. And I was going through a, a somewhat of a difficult time uh, with my manager, if you will, at that time. And, um, and I was really struck by this you know, coercive power um, and and felt like that's what was happening. Um, could you talk a little bit about coercive power, especially since you brought up, you know, this, this sort of being over people? Sure. That's what we see when we talk about harassment and and bullying and humiliation in the workplace and people feeling like feeling like they don't belong um, is forced forcing people or telling people what to do rather than bringing your team along, motivating them and getting them on board. So that's a great question. I have a story about early in my career about power. And I was, uh, there was an opportunity to be a manager and I was a statistician and I didn't have quite all the requirements for the manager's job, but I recommended myself for it. And I recommended combining that job with my current job. And guess what? I got the job. And my supervisor was very, was okay with it until one of the people on the team said they were going to quit because I got the job over her. So what happened was my supervisor wouldn't announce it. And I was already in the role working and everybody was wondering why I was doing all these things. And I had made a suggestion to improve a system that went from 75% error to 2% error. It was very successful. And they were having a meeting to debrief the new system. Well, guess who didn't get invited to the meeting? Me. So one of my colleagues said, hey, Linda, how come you're not in this meeting? It's about the new system. I said, you know, I don't know. So what I did was a second before the meeting was gonna start, I took my notepad, 
I proudly marched into the meeting. I sat down and I looked at my boss who did not invite me. And I said, oh, it's okay, don't worry. I know you meant to invite me to the meeting. And there was nothing he could do or say in front of everybody. I was already there. I love that. I love that. And so in that example, it it sounds to me like you really took back your power, right? That maybe someone was trying to usurp you, but you were able to really get in there and show, you know, this is my project. I own this. I did this. And I think that what happens in academia and other industries as well, but we've spent a lot of time in academia, is that we are left out of rooms, um, sometimes intentionally and sometimes just because people weren't even thinking about it, like they didn't think it through. And so it can be very um, hurtful to us and um, people don't always understand the impact that it could have. That's right. And you know the saying, make sure you get a seat at the table. Well, I have a saying better than that. It's why settle for a seat at the table when you can take the lead at the table. I love that. I love that. I'm going to definitely write that down and I'm sure our listeners will as well. So we were talking uh, in another conversation and you mentioned to me about this notion of power and likability. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So when you look at some of the research that I've studied um, for power and executive presence, you see that women and people of color are judged somewhat differently than white males, according to a lot of research by Sylvia Ann Hewlett from the Center for Talent Innovation. And what it says, and also in a recent article from Harvard Business Review, is that White males can just be powerful and they're widely accepted as powerful, but women and people of color cannot. Women and people of color have to be both powerful and likable. Now, what do I mean by likability? I mean, trustworthy, approachable, powerful, but not too powerful. Yes, I hate to say it. We have to be careful with that um, because a, a very, very strong, powerful whim, woman or a person of color sometimes does not fit the paradigm of the people we're working with. So what does likability mean? It means that you're authentic. It means that you smile more. It means that you ask more questions. You don't talk as loud. And some of those subtle things that mean you are powerful, but you're not at the top of the power peak. That is so interesting. And I, I know in my experience, there have been times where I think I came to learn that. Um, I'd been in some meetings where I, I felt like, you know what, the way that they're looking at me, they think I'm threatening them. So maybe I need to smile, which was so icky. I mean, I, that's the only word I can think of at this time, because why should I have to be anything other than myself? And why is there this lens that I'm being viewed through that diminishes what I'm bringing, what I'm saying, what I'm contributing, and I have to put on this sort of different face to present the package. So I, I definitely appreciate that um, research and, and we'll be looking more into that. So now that we're, we've talked a bit about power and we've talked about likability, let's talk some more about executive presence. That's really a big topic right now. Um, then reading about that, I see it more and more. You mentioned the Harvard Business Review. It seems to be all over. So in terms of you know, what we're thinking about in terms of leaders and leadership, and we all are leaders in some way or another, whether you have a, a dean's position, a chair's provost, or even if in your own community, tell me about this executive presence and, and how that sort of shapes out for people of color and women. I'd be happy to. Well, according to the research again by Sylvia Ann Hewlett, um, there are three components of executive presence. It's gravitas, communications, and appearance. And first I wanna explain a little bit about what executive presence is 
besides those two components. So when we think about being successful, we think about performance, right? We think about, oh, I got the project done on time at a high quality. I delivered all my deliverables. Well, performance is not, success is not just performance. Success is heavily dependent upon your reputation or how you come across to others and that is executive presence. Have we ever run into someone who can talk a great game, they're very personable, they have charisma, they're optimistic, but they don't have the, the, the performance, but they get the promotion instead of someone else. Why? Because they have the reputation in the organization. So executive presence is our reputation with others. It's how we come across to other people. And gravitas is the first part, it's 67%. And that's our charisma. How do we hold ourselves when we walk into a room? Do people wanna to get to know us? Are they drawn to us? Do we keep our commitments and do what we say? Do people look up to us and wanna follow us as a leader? That's gravitas. The second part, communication, is are we authentic? Are we honest? Um, are we clear? Do people trust us? And the third part is appearance. And it doesn't mean, of course, you have to look like a movie star. What it means is that you're polished looking, you're contemporary, you exude energy and passion about what you do, you're neatly dressed, neat in appearance, and you seem credible and likable. So those are the three components of executive presence. And often to be successful, we focus on the actual performance, doing the tasks of the job, and we don't focus enough on our reputation. That is so interesting. It calls to mind uh, this concept that I heard about with law enforcement called command presence. Have you ever heard of that before? I have. Yeah. So to me, this sort of nicely rounds it out because in law enforcement, the command presence is when you, you walk into the room and your uniform is, you know, is, there's not a piece of lint on it and everything's lined up perfectly and your shoes are shined. And so this is also military, right? Um, and so as soon as you walk into the room, people pay attention to you because you just exude this confidence in your outer appearance. And then the next step is like when you talk, you use your outdoor voice and, and this kind of thing. But I don't know that that would work so well, you know, if you're going into a department meeting or something like that, because you don't want to be, you know, using this big booming voice. So what I like about the executive presence is that it seems like it's tailored more towards, you know, a business environment. Let me respond to that a little bit. You know, when I coach people, um, I oftentimes they're working on their power and holding their power and creating their power. But sometimes people are too powerful uh, and women and people of color are especially judged sometimes to be too powerful if they have a booming voice or their voice is loud or they have a big physical presence, tall, muscular, et cetera. And you think, well, we are what we are, but people judge you on what you are. And so I call power, uh, remember those old radios when we had a dial and we could turn the, <laughs> turn the volume up and down? Well, power, you can turn your volume up and down. And if you're very powerful, you can turn that power down just a little bit, depending on who your audience is. If you're a member of a department and you're not leading the meeting, you might want to dial that power down a bit. However, if you're not being heard in the meeting, which I hear a lot from women and people of color, I put forth that idea and 10 minutes later, this other guy puts it forth and it's the same idea and they love it. So if I find I'm not being heard, that's when I dial up my power. Great, great. And do you have any examples of, uh, you know, maybe someone you coached in this area? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a person who had been promoted to the executive ranks and she was putting together a meeting and she wrote to her supervisor who was the CEO and said, oh, we're doing this presentation to the board. Who should I have present? And the CEO wrote back, I don't know, you're the leader, whoever you think. And she realized that she had just given away her power. So remember when you're given options that you take that top seat, you take that visible seat, only give away options that are not as important. Now I shouldn't say only because that sounds very mercenary, but make sure that you use those opportunities to showcase yourself. Now I hear all the time, Dr. Hill, that people say, well, I don't like to showcase myself. I just like to work hard and eventually I'll get promoted. Well, my word of advice to you would be not likely. Now we have to showcase ourselves. The world is highly competitive. We're in a Zoom world. Uh, people want that reputation. They want you to look like a leader, talk like a leader, walk like a leader. If they don't see those leadership qualities in you, you will be forgotten and bypassed. So a lot of what I do with some of my clients who I coach is to help them learn to showcase themselves and to create their power. That That's great. I can even relate to what you were saying about giving away power. I think maybe it could be just me, but I've heard of you other women of color and women um, sort of fall back, right? Where we say, well, no, you know, you're the person in charge or you're the one. So, so even if we're not using those words, that's what we do. We just go back to like second seat or you, you used your uh, analogy earlier about having a seat at the table and sitting at the front of the table. Um, I know that sometimes when we go into rooms, we'll, we'll sit at the periphery. Or we won't even sit at the table. We'll just take the seat on the outside, even if we have the same, you know, uh, role as a, a colleague, if we're both chairs or if we're both leaders, women will send, tend to be on the outside or will give up our power. So I appreciate you giving those concrete examples of, of how not to do it and how to do it. So I'm thinking, you know, what, uh, what can somebody do to develop their executive presence? That's a great question, Dr. Hill. Um, you know, we have to learn to showcase ourselves. Number one, I tell my coaches, if you don't talk, no one knows your value. They'll say, well, it's a high level meeting and it's the first time. And, and so always say something, but make sure it's something of value that contributes to the purpose of the meeting. Other things we can do is to learn to develop our confidence and how proud we are of ourselves and what we have to contribute. One of the things that I like to do with clients is have them write down their 10 gifts to the world. Well, not to you, not to your mother, not to your child, but to the world. What is it that you, that is unique and different about you that you bring to the world? Other things we can do to develop is practice talking to people. Learn how to get the gift of gab. Learn how to make small talk. Look at a meeting and size up who's important. If you're networking, who do you network with? Who's most important? And the other thing is to get a sponsor and build your high level relationships within your organization. Now, what is a sponsor? It's more than a coach or mentor. It's someone within your organization at a very senior level who's going to promote you, talk about you, push you, get you stretch assignments, because often women and people of color are looked over or not seen in those opportunities. I have a story about when I worked at the steel mill and there were 25,000 people working there and it was about 2% women. And the manager that I worked under was retiring and they were interviewing for his position. 
And I said, what about me for the manager's position? I had worked side by side with this person for two or three years. You know what they said, Dr. Hill? They said, oh, we never thought of you. So if I didn't speak up, I would have never been thought of. That is one of the things that I have just really come to respect about you, Dr. Liang, is how you are willing to put yourself out there, how you have shown us how to give ourselves our own voice, right? Or how to use that voice. And so your examples of things that you've done throughout your career and how you coached other people in their career about executive presence, the difference between power and, you know, control and how we need to really know about these different concepts so that we can dig deeper into them and into ourselves and use them and be able to identify what is useful, what is not useful, and how to really help ourselves elevate. So I also heard you say um, that you use a lot of research and, and I know because we've worked together before that you use a number of assessment tools. Can you tell us uh, if there are any assessment tools out there about executive presence or you know what could I do if I wanted to look at myself in this area of executive presence? That's a great question again, Dr. Hill. So executive presence, there aren't any published tools out there, but some of the um, avenues that I use would be to know your leadership strengths and get your leadership skills assessed through a leadership 360. And that's something where you get feedback about your leadership from your supervisor, your peers, and if you have them, your direct reports. And it's candid, anonymous feedback about how you lead. So that's number one. Number two would be to work with a coach who can help you to A, measure your executive presence. How do you come across when you're giving a speech? How do you handle conflict? What do you do when you need to push back? And I've heard a lot of individuals say, I hate conflict or I don't want to push back. But actually, Dr. Hill, there are a lot of tools in our coaching toolboxes, and Dr. Hill is the coach as well, that we can give you that will help you to structure that conflict and know how to respond. So another way is to work with a coach. Now, I do have a power quiz also that I'm in the process of trademarking based on my research in power. So in order to be confident and powerful, you need to know yourself. You need to know your leadership strengths, what you're good at, and how to use those strengths to gain power and influence. So that's great. And I'm looking forward to taking your, uh, your quiz, your power quiz, so that I can see how I come out. I, I've done a number of assessments with you and they've, they've been great. So we work with a, a different people at different levels in their careers in academia. There's some you know, junior faculty who are just starting out all the way up to people who are, you know, at the level of presidency or serving on boards. So, you know, where would I really need to come in and have an assessment like this? Would it, would it be the junior faculty or would it be when I'm a dean or a chair? Where would I, where would this be most beneficial for me in my, you know, my career path? Another great question. Well, I always think it's a good idea to know your leadership strengths, whether you're a junior faculty or senior faculty. I work with both uh, high level leaders in higher ed, as well as corporate and healthcare, banking, manufacturing, uh, utilities, government, et cetera. So number one, I always think when we look at the emotional intelligence model, which is part of executive presence and emotional intelligence is knowing your own emotions and recognizing the emotions of others to help you to be a better leader. 
So um, it's always great. The first step of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. So if you're starting out, whether you're an entry-level leader and everybody is a leader, even an individual contributor in some way. So I always say at first, it's great to know what your leadership strengths are. So I would recommend an assessment on your strengths. There are the other pieces of executive presence, emotional intelligence, there is an assessment for that. There's the DISC profile, which measure, measures your communication style. So if you're having difficulty communicating with someone on your team, for example, you seem to bump heads or even with your supervisor, you're not on the same page or you're thinking, what just happened in that conversation? It's typically a difference in communication style. And what the DISC profile does, it allows you not only to know your own, but to be able to interpret others' behavior, to know their communication style so that you can adapt your style to their style and be more successful in your communication. And I have some other assessments as well. One is the conflict style. And that's if you're if you're meeting a lot of conflict in your team or at work, that could be helpful. And also a change leadership style uh, intelligence quotient. We're all going through rapid change and having to be agile and responsive at work. So knowing your change leadership style is often helpful. That's great. And I, I really appreciate you. Uh, sort of underlying the the statement about you could be a junior faculty, uh, new in the career space, wherever you are, and it's still good to have an assessment, even beginning with the emotional intelligence, because you could be tasked with a project, or if you're working with a coach, or you're trying to strategize how to make yourself more visible where you are, you can volunteer for a project. And so with that project, you're going to be working with you know other folks even if it's just two or three of you so knowing your emotional intelligence and your leadership style so that the task can be completed successfully and then you end up with some people who will be able to support you later down the line right right and if i could jump in for a second especially in higher education um i've been a department chair and an interim online dean and you find that, and I, I currently am working on the fifth grant for professors in STEM education. And these are uh, people of color with PhDs in uh, IT, physics, uh, and so forth. Very, very intelligent and capable people. And they don't know their leadership strengths. Why? Because in academia, you get very little feedback about leadership. You might get feedback on how you taught your course, or you might get student evaluations, but you get very, very little feedback on your leadership strengths. And people don't know their strengths or their blind spots, which are things they think they're good at that perhaps they're not as good at, or their hidden strengths where they might be really fantastic and they have no idea. I I recently coached someone who was going to a meeting. They were asked to participate in a high-level national meeting at NASA. And they said, well, I'm just going to go and listen. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I said, you have these great leadership strengths. Look at what they are. And he went, he participated, and he came back, and he said, they asked me to lead a whole separate committee based on my participation. So knowing your strengths is really, really important, particularly in higher education. I couldn't agree more, uh, particularly with what you said about getting very little feedback um, outside of the area of student evaluations and maybe something that your department chair, your, your personnel evaluation, and, and there's nothing in there about leadership styles or e emotional intelligence or any of that. So I, I agree. I think that if you are in academia, it would be particularly a great investment to work with a coach to have some of these assessments done 
early on, and then you can revisit them as you move through your career. Absolutely. Most of the time when the assessments are highly reliable and highly valid, your results are fairly similar over the years. However, if you do change a leadership role or the culture of your organization changes, let's say it, you go from a slow, sleepy organization to a fast-paced, cutthroat, highly competitive, you may shift your leadership style somewhat or you may use your strengths differently. Great, great. Well, this has been such a rich conversation today. We've learned so much about power, executive presence, the difference between power and control, some types of power, how we can adjust our presence in the room, um, and how we need to adapt uh, how we may need to adapt given the audience. So thank you again, Dr. Liang. And how can people reach you? Uh, what's your website? Great, thank you, Dr. Hill. I so appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and to have this conversation with you. I hope that going forward, the people that listen can take some kernel or nugget of information and use it to help catapult their own careers. So uh, my website, the name of my business, again, it's Linda Liang, and the name of my business is Organizational Resources. So the website is www.orgresources.com. Again, that's www. And it's O R G R E S O U R C E S dot com. And my email is Linda, L I N D A, at orgresources.com. And I thank you so very much for this opportunity today. You're very welcome. And we will provide a link to your website so that folks can get in touch with you in case they didn't have a pen or pencil handy. So don't worry about that. We will provide that for you. And we want to thank you again for joining us today at the Academic Career Coach with Dr. Loren M. Hill. We hope that you enjoyed this talk today. Please like and share and subscribe to us. And we can be reached at www.theacclivity.com. Looking forward to meeting with you all again next time in this same space. Thank you again, Dr. Liang. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Everyone have a great day. All right. Take good care, everybody. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. And be powerful. That's right. Be powerful.